We are now recording. Okay, excellent. So we have about T, T minus two minutes before we go. Okay, sounds good. So what's the weather like there right now? Uh, about 60 <laughs> and uh, slightly cloudy, but yes, uh, it, yeah. it's, uh, it's nothing like where you are. No, well, we've had it fairly nice. We're going to have a couple of cold days this weekend, but that's it. And by cold, I mean minus 20. Yes, so. yes, yes, yes. Well, you're from Winnipeg, so you're used to that. That's not that bad. Yes, Winnipeg, where you get the prairie winds. Mm -hmm. But it's a dry cold. <laughs> yes, I got a taste of it when I lived in Champaign, Illinois, but that's nothing compared to that far north and west. No. Yes, I'm from Rochester, New York, so we're used to the snow. Yeah, yeah, you probably get more snow than we do. Oh yes, we get a lot more snow lake effect, but we're not used to the uh, ex as much to the extreme cold. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Jeff. I really oh, thank you for accepting. I mean, it's very. Uh, this was what the this was the one where I had the hardest time finding experts, uh, and uh, then I saw you uh, review an H Diplo of your article in, uh, in I believe it was uh, International Journal International Security. Yeah, it could be. I, I, it was in 2019. It was your co-authored one. Mm -hmm. I saw a review of that, and so then I uh, emailed you. I'm like, aha, I have an expert. Yes. <clears throat> Could, obviously, couldn't find any in Texas. And the only one they knew is they referred me to someone in, uh, I think, in Uppsala in or somewhere in Sweden. And uh, otherwise, I, yeah, I was not getting any good leads. Well, the problem with the, the Scandinavians do good research, but they really bought into this Arctic exceptionalism. They think somehow, yes. you know, the geopolitics stops at the Arctic Circle. Which, <laughs> yes, yes, very true, very true. In, anyway, you'll see I don't agree with that position. Yes, yes, so we'll have a lot to discuss. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so uh, it is noon uh, and uh, we shall begin. Uh, just a reminder that this is being recorded. Uh, welcome to uh, Great Decisions 2021. Our talk today uh, with Rob uh, Hubert uh, uh, from the University of Calgary, and he'll be discussing the fight over the melting Arctic. Uh, just a reminder that this presentation uh, is going to, over the next hour, is going to be recorded. Uh, he will give it, I will introduce him, he will give a talk, and then he will answer uh, your questions. And so uh, as you go along and um, listen, uh, you can message your questions to the group, or, and then I will uh, read them at the end. Uh, first of all, I would like to announce that this lecture series is a collaboration of the League of Women Voters of Tyler Smith County, the AAUW, the American Association of University Women of Tyler, the Tyler Public Library, and the Foreign Policy Association. My name is Jeffrey Crean. I'll be your host today, and I will introduce our guest uh, speaker, who we're very honored to have, uh, Rob Hubert. Uh, we've, uh, because we do Zoom this year, we were able to get speakers from far and wide, uh, but uh, you have the honor of being the one from furthest away and our one international speaker. Uh, so Rob Hubert is an associate, associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Calgary. He also served as the associate director of the Center for uh, military and strategic studies. He was appointed as a member of the Canadian Polar Commission, now renamed Canadian Polar Knowledge, for a term lasting from 2010 to 2015. He uh, has also been a research fellow with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, uh, taught at Memorial University, Dalhousie University, and the University of Manitoba, in addition to uh, before his uh, present job at the University of Calgary. He has published in a number of journals, including Canadian Art Arctic Security, Maritime Security, Canadian Defense, International Journal, Canadian Foreign Policy, Assuma Canadian Journal of Policy Research, and Canadian Military Journal. He's the co-editor of the Commercial Satellite Industry and United Nations Peacekeeping uh, of that book, and also of Breaking Ice, uh, Canadian Integrated Ocean Management in the Canadian North. His most recent book, written with Whitney Lackenbauer and Franklin Griffith, is uh, Canada and the Changing Arctic. Sovereignty, Security, and Stewardship. He also comments on Canadian security and Arctic issues in both the Canadian and the international uh, media. So you're in for a uh, treat today with one of the uh, leading world experts on this important topic. And with that, I give the floor to you, Rob. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say my thanks to the various associations that have invited me to share some of my thoughts on um, Arctic security and what is happening. 
um, the understanding of the key decisions that have gotten us back into a situation where I would argue we have returned to uh, very much of the, the, the problematic uh, period of the Cold War when the Arctic was probably the most important strategic front that existed, probably more important than the Western Front in, uh, that divided the Germanies, and that if a nuclear war was either to be deterred or fought, it was in fact to be fought over the Arctic region. So let me just call up my slides right now. Uh, let's see, there we go. Okay, so I'd like to begin with the with the, the discussion of just sort of setting the stage um, in in our conversations about the great decisions. In other words, how can we understand where we are today by looking at these a series of critical decisions that have more or less created with a certain degree of certainty that we would be having a return of the geopolitics. Now, for those of you that follow uh, international relations or, or these uh, great issues in the a broader um, international media sphere and beyond, <clears throat> you will know that there has been substantial discussion in the media, by think tanks, at universities, and even amongst policymakers about the return of the great game or the growing importance of geopolitical rivalries within the international sphere. A lot of attention, of course, is given to such issues such as the melting ice cover, the prospects of new resources, new shipping routes, and so forth. Those are all important, but what I'd like to be focusing on and, and tracing for you, if I may, are the decisions that have ultimately become the most important for the creation of the geopolitical centrality of the Arctic. The melting ice, the changing um, economic opportunities are all very important variables, but they are intervening variables. They are not the driving features for why indeed we have returned to an Arctic that is so geopolitically important. Now, when we start talking about the importance of the geopolitics or what some people say, the great game, it has to be appreciated that we have been in a cold war over the Arctic since the end of the Second World War. And for some analysts, this stopped at the end of the actual Cold War. But if we actually look at what was happening, particularly in the periods between 1991 up until 2014, it will become very apparent that is not an issue of a Cold War ending in the Arctic, even though politically it might seem that, but rather the reality that we had an exhausted Russia that could not maintain its part of the challenge within that regime. As we have an Arctic, uh, as we have a Russia that is recovering, now, of course, it's not terribly surprising to see that the centrality of the Arctic in the strategic context has once again reemerged. The other major factor that we need to take into consideration is that decisions made about particular weapon systems and specifically the strategic weapons of the major powers absolutely guarantee that the Arctic was the important theater of operation during the Cold War and that it will continue to be the important theater of operation well into the future. Once again, this has nothing to do with the melting ice or economic changes, but rather just in the type of weapons in terms of both their delivery and explosive capabilities, and specifically on the development of nuclear weapons and the various missile systems that carry them. The third point that I would like to stress is that even though that the Arctic often is out of people's minds because of its remote location and lack of a po overall population, with of course the very important exception of the indigenous peoples that live in the far north regions of Canada, Alaska, the Scandinavian countries and Russia, that it has never been that far away from the geopolitical centrality of the international system. Just as a tidbit, one of the decisions that the Russians had to sell Alaska to the United States, not to Great Britain, and why Alaska is an American state and not a Canadian province, had everything to do with geopolitics. The Russians, of course, had just finished fighting a war with the British and French in Crimea, and they were going to be damned if they were going to sell anything that gave an advantage to the British. And so therefore, they approached the Americans for Alaska. Uh, once again, uh, illustrating the centrality of the geopolitics of it. 
So what are the key decisions? Well, to actually understand where we are today, we of course have to go back to our history. And we have to look at the first period of the modern geopolitics importance of the Arctic region. And that is of course during World War II. There were a series of decisions that were made in this period that basically started us off to ensure that the Arctic is at the central location of the geopolitical tensions that are now arising between Russia, the United States, and we have to add China. The three core decisions, of course, were first and foremost, the Japanese invasion of the Aleutian Islands. Once again, this is uh, often forgotten in the, in the greater understanding of the, uh, the campaign by the Japanese to seize and attack Midway Island, but it illustrated to North American leaders, both Canada and the United States, the fact that the Arctic is not immune from military attack. And it came as a bit of a surprise, of course, when Kishu and Atu were, uh, were attacked and seized by the Japanese, but it was, of course, the awakening that the Arctic, just because it's cold, just because it is north, it is not immune. More importantly, though, for our story is the reality that there are two key strategic weapon uh, developments that are made during the Second World War. The first one is the German decision to explore and subsequently develop missile technology. The second decision is the decision by the Americans, supported by Canada and the United Kingdom, to explore and develop ultimately the nuclear bomb. And both of these decisions are well, uh, are, are well established in other literature. But what they leave us with at the end of the Second World War and what becomes critical to the purposes of our discussion is that we now have a weapon system that is by far best deployed over the Arctic region, given the development of the Cold War. So in other words, we have a weapon system that doesn't matter in terms of whether or not we had maintained good relationships with the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War, that if you were the United States to hit any of your targets over in Asia or Europe, you would be firing over the Arctic region. And likewise, in terms of nuclear deterrence, any enemy striking you from these regions would of course be firing their weapon systems over the Arctic. And so therefore you needed to have your surveillance systems. So. The Arctic remains the central location. First of all, of course, we have the bomber delivery systems, and that was the decision to build the, the B-29, of course, and in which case, if the Americans found themselves with their allies at war with the Soviet Union, it would be over the, the central Arctic regions that these aircraft would be fighting. And likewise, for Canada and US relations, the need to defend against a possible Soviet bomber attack led to a very close series of uh, decisions, one of which was the creation of the NORAD Alliance system in 1956 that is still in place today. Now, the next major decision period that we have is, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the decisions here were, of course, the Soviet decision to go with a reform-minded leader under the name, of course, Gorbachev. And Gorbachev's subsequent decisions to introduce a series of policies of reform, perestroika, glasnost, that ultimately led to the fall of the Soviet Union and the creation of a much smaller Russia. One that, of course, during this period becomes economically and militarily exhausted. This is what creates what is known as a period of Arctic exceptionalism. And the fact of the matter is uh, the United States, Canada, Great Britain, Norway spend substantial amounts of monies to help the Soviet Union slash Russia get rid of many of these nuclear weapon systems and particularly their submarines. In fact, the United States spends probably in the realm of 100 billion, Canada spends in the tens of billions. Uh, so there was a very significant effort to try to change the, this dynamic. Unfortunately, the dynamic did not ultimately change. We saw Canada and Finland trying to, to increase international cooperation through multilateral behaviors, through the creation of new Arctic institutions. And these did have a lot of success in improving uh, relationships, particularly in regards to understanding and responding to the impacts of climate change to both the Arctic states and to the international system in general.
At the same time, however, decisions were made by the NATO alliance to allow expansion, not only to the former uh, Warsaw Pact members, but also to the former members of the Soviet Union. And in particular, in 2004, the decision was made, led by the United States government, to include the Baltic state in the expansion of NATO. Now, once again, you might ask, how does this deal with the Arctic? It sets the stage for what then becomes a return to the geopolitics. We enter next into a period of time that can be referred to as the revival of the strategic imperative. And this really overlaps with the rise of Putin, who of course comes to power at the beginning of the 2000s, <clears throat> but he's able to consolidate his power and particularly revive the Russian economy through centralization of the oil and gas industry amongst other um, avenues. And to point out that the oil and gas of Russia's future is in the Arctic region. So once again, we come back to the centrality of the Arctic from a geoeconomic perspective for the Soviet Union slash Russia. And we've now entered, and this is the period that I wish to be talking about in terms of how all of these decisions now lead us into the revival of the Cold War in the Arctic region. And this is for the period that of course, follows the Russian decision to intervene militarily and seize by military force the Crimea and to engage in warfare or what's referred to as hybrid warfare with the Ukraines on their eastern border. Now, what is this new Arctic tri triangle um, that I often call the new Arctic strategic triangle, nasty for short? Well, we have the existence of three competing powers. We have the rise of a China, we have the renewed challenge of Russia, and the response of the United States. Geography means that the central location where they meet is in the Arctic region. And as I said earlier, continuances in weapon technology, particularly the weapon technology related to strategic nuclear and tactical forces, means that the Arctic is the most important regime that is now there. So what are the key decisions in terms of this return of the geopolitics in the Arctic and what should we be the most focused on? Well, Putin makes the decision in 2007 to return Russia to great power status. And in particular, what this means is an attempt to achieve power over the regions, the near abroad of the Soviet, former Soviet Union. And so these decisions require foreign policy and uh, defense policy changes. For defense policy, it is a reactivation of Russian strategic forces. These are primarily based in the Arctic region. And once again, even if Russia had remained a liberal democracy, even if it had remained a close friend, even if it had returned and possibly had joined NATO itself, the Arctic still would have been the central location for the placement of the strategic forces of Russia. And we see this in 2007 and 2015, very important decisions made where to put their monies and their money was in the reactivation of their strategic capabilities. They also made the decision to use military force to stop any subsequent NATO expansion. So the 2004 included inclusion of, of the Baltic states was then met by a foreign policy decision that in NATO was to expand again they would be met with force. And we've seen this in 2008 in Georgia, and we've seen it in 2014 with, the, with Ukraine. We've seen the rebuilding of the Russian nuclear deterrent, and we've seen the decision to build and protect this nuclear deterrent, which means that the Russians have built a series of air bases and reactivated many from the Cold War in their Arctic region. And so the Russians, through these processes, has re emerged in this era as the Arctic regional hegemon. Now, this graphic shows you the locations of where these bases are, and you can see that they go the entire Arctic. And once again, it is geographically determined because that is where their deterrent is. That is where their most important military capabilities are. But you see that the significance it then places on the Arctic. Now, if we look at the key US decisions that then also fuel into this overall process, 
We have the first decision that in the period that the Russians, the Soviet Union, the uh, and the, uh, slash Russia is exhausted, is that the Americans make a decision that even though this is a time period that the Cold War seems to be over, there cannot be a military oriented organization in the Arctic region. They keep, of course, the maintenance of the NATO alliance, but that does not include the neutral Arctic states and nor does it include the Russians. They also go so far as to say for the new multilateral organization, specifically the AEPS, which is the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, that is then followed by the Arctic Council. They specifically say that they will only join these organizations if they do not exclude the, any considerations of hard security. And it is written into their charters. The second element that we have to take into consideration, it seems un Arctic, but it is of course the American decision along with its NATO allies to use military force to achieve policy objectives. And this was first of all, clearly formulated in the decision to go to war in Afghanistan in 2001 to respond to the terrorist attacks on, of 9-11 and the subsequent war to, uh, to overthrow the regime in, um, in Iraq in 2003. <clears throat> We also have the decision of the Americans to not only support, but actually to push NATO expansion to include the former Soviet republics. And so this was a decision that comes forward in 2001, but ultimately is seen to come into effect in 2004 when the Baltic states are allowed in. This, of course, is seen as a major threat by Putin's administration and probably would have been seen as a major threat by any Russian administration. The other core decision is despite the, the, the understanding of many that the Cold War has ended, the United States also made the decision to maintain its core military capabilities in the Arctic. That meant the maintenance of its uh, submarine attack force that would continue to give Arctic capabilities, the placement and development of one of the most important anti-ballistic missile bases in Fort Greeley, Alaska, and the maintenance of Fort, uh, Fort Almendorf as one of the most important aerospace bases for American air superiority of not only the, the, the immediate uh, Pacific region, but also going into the entire Arctic. Now, what this also leads in the current era is a series of decisions by the United States to rethink its overall strategic policies. Probably most important was a rethinking of its new nuclear weapons policy that is now placing tactical weapons on their, submar uh, on their nuclear submarine deterrent force, the Ohio class, and also to reactivate and to build up its capabilities to not only deter its um, no, new or renewed um, uh, peer competitors, i.e. the Russians and Chinese, but also if need be to be able to actually utilize nuclear weapons against smaller enemies such as possibly North Korea, Iran, and once again because of the centrality of the Arctic this is where a lot of American thinking has gone. As they have increased their move back to the use of tactical weapons that means they also have to give further thought and have given further, further thought to the ballistic missile defenses to respond to any counter from the North Koreans, Iranians, and so forth. There has also been a substantial rethinking and, and continuance of the buildup of the anti-ballistic system in Alaska. And there are, of course, current discussions with both Canada to modernize the NORAD system. And there are, of course, very significant efforts with the Greenland slash Denmark government. We know that the Trump administration caused a lot of headlines with the offer to buy Greenland, but really what that was all about was the modernization and expansion of the base in Thule, Greenland, which is of course all part and parcel of this. Now, where we have the resumption, where all of of these decisions and lead into is, of course, the deterioration that we've seen in the context of relations between Russia and the United States and its allies. And that, of course, was sparked by the decision to invade the Crimea and to engage in war with Ukraine, to basically keep the Ukrainians out of the EU and out of NATO. <clears throat> 
I mean, once again, we have public statements by Putin, but it's clear that that was, in fact, the driving motivation on it. We also have the United States not only developing its strategic forces and thinking about it in the Arctic region, we have seen a flurry of policy statements and po uh, strategies coming from the Air Force, uh, the Navy, and we expect to see one from the Army, and we already have one from the Coast Guard. So there is significant thinking in terms of how, once again, the United States is going to be able to fight in the Arctic region and to defend its interest in this region, something that many people had thought had in fact was over. We've seen the decision made to reactivate and re-engage the American surface fleet in the high north. Part of this is of course being driven by the decreasing ice cover, but the real driver for the standing up of the second fleet and the resumption of uh, carrier task groups being sent into Alaskan waters was responding to this changing geopolitical environment. This was something that the United States had stopped doing. And in fact, just as a little tidbit, I can say with a certain degree of pride as a Canadian, one of the first things that the US Navy did when it was re-standing up the second fleet to go into Arctic waters was to request that a Canadian admiral could serve as the second in command of second fleet to impart his particular knowledge and expertise in operating in high climate environments. And so the second in command of the second fleet is a Canadian, which often happens in terms of the close relationship between the two countries. We also had a lot of policy statements under the former Trump administration at the senior level. Probably the best known is Secretary uh, Pompeo's statement at the Arctic Council meeting where he explicitly blamed the Russians and the Chinese as a new security threat in the region and as an explanation for why the United States is once again reactivating its multiple military capabilities in the region. As an aside and a point that many Canadians did not understand, Pompeo also took this time to attack Canada. Canada for the Canadian position on the Northwest Passage, something that we had thought we had resolved with the Americans back in the um, uh, er, 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 late 1980s. But once again, just showing how many decisions are at play right now. Now, we now, and this is probably the, the confounding aspect, the part that we're still having troubles understanding the decisions, because China, of course, is a closed society. But we know that there have been a several key decisions by the Chinese that now tell us that we can expect that it is not going to be a bipolar Arctic Cold War that we are returning to with this new geopolitical influence, the influences that are occurring, but it's going to be tripolar. And this adds a complexity that did not exist during the former or the first stages of the Cold War. And to be quite frank, we don't understand how this is actually going to play itself out. So what are the key decisions? Well, one of the key decisions, of course, and we have to once again go back in our history. It was during after, in the aftermath of the Tiananmen Square crisis for the Chinese government. They made the very clear decision, as we can now appreciate, to liberalize their economy, to improve their economic standing in the international system, and to ensure increase party control over the political governance. So they did the exact opposite of what the Russians did. They entered their economy, opened it up, made it as, 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 as liberalized as an authoritative state can, but unlike the Russians, did not open up their political system. What this really was to do, and we see this in some of the Chinese literature is to respond to what they see as the hundred uh, the century of humiliation, where China was basically removed from its rightful place as a center of the international system. And once again, this shows up in all their literature, and to basically return China as a great power. Now, we think in terms in Canada and North America, we tend to think in terms of four year periods. Uh, Politi politically, and that's because of our political system. The Chinese think in much longer time periods. And so therefore a decision made in 1989 is of course now having very strong ramifications. And the 
the reason why the market is liberalized for the Chinese is very much to allow them to then de develop and pay for a military that can challenge the United States and Russia for that matter. We don't talk about it that much, but it, it's there. And the Chinese and Russians both know that there is a, a, an association of convenience that really characterizes their relationship today and one that nobody really anticipates will last. They also made the decision to start to develop polar interests. And this starts in 1984, when they decide to join the Antarctic Treaty and they established a base in Antarctica in 1984. They subsequently then used that expertise to develop an interest in the Arctic beginning in 1999. Canada and the United States were very surprised when a Chinese icebreaker, the Zhu Long, literally showed up unannounced in one of the Canadian uh, northern uh, communities, Tuk to Yuk Tuk. Now, they said, and our foreign affairs may have bobbled the ball on this, but uh, regardless, when they showed up, actually physically showed up in this, this is right on the Canada-US border between Alaska and Yukon, um, Tuk to Yuk Tuk is actually in Northwest Territory, so it's right by there. But uh, it was a surprise to us. We did not think the Chinese had that capability to get there, and we did not think that they were interested. They've subsequently expanded that interest, focusing on science, focusing on economics, but are now developing a military capability. This is a, a map from the Chinese white paper on their Arctic policy. And the Chinese, of course, referred to themselves at that policy paper as a near Arctic state. But once again, we see a clear understanding that the Arctic is central to the Chinese plans in terms of its, uh, re uh, one would say, return from a Chinese perspective. For us, it's the becoming of a great power. And so that we can see that Arctic is in front central. Anybody who understands the geopoliticals behind the Chinese decisions can also appreciate that the Chinese have in fact been building a navy that can operate in any part of the international system. This follows from, of course, the writings of the American naval strategist, Alfred Mahan, who basically said, if you want to be a real power, you have to ensure that your navies can go anywhere. If there is a competitor that can stop you, you will ultimately lose to that competitor. And he gives the examples of the French losing to the, um, uh, to the British after the Napoleonic period. Subsequent authors have pointed out that this is probably why the Germans were not able to replace the British as a hegemonic power and why the Soviet Union ultimately failed to be able to defeat the Western forces led by the Americans. We see clearly that the Chinese are in fact making the decision to develop that Arctic naval capability. Starting in 2015, they're starting to teach themselves how to operate in higher and higher northern waters. We haven't yet seen specific naval capabilities beyond the construction of a number of uh, of Navy specific icebreakers. So the Chinese do have four icebreakers that are naval vessels. Uh, these tend to be smaller vessels utilized for some of their northern bases uh, uh, in, in, within Asia Pacific waters. They are building icebreakers uh, that are not specific to the Navy, but we expect to be seeing that changing in the future. The question that many people are asking is what about their submarine forces? Are they going to be giving their, particularly their attack submarines, will they give them an Arctic capability? That requires certain construction decisions. It also requires the ability to train and operate. We haven't yet seen it, but the suspicion is that their most recent submarines that they are now building, the Type 94s and the 96s, will in fact have an under um, ice capabilities because we're seeing this in their literature. We're starting to see this in their engineering journals that are open to the international uh, arena. The questions of how do you actually get a submarine under the ice is a technical question that is increasingly being examined within these journals. So that's given us a pretty good indication that this is to come. This is, of course, a map of the efforts of the Chinese to copy, well, to be frank, 
the British success in becoming a hegemonic naval power during the height of its colonial era, and why the United States was, of course, such a dominant power following the Second World War. And that is the development and protection of a series of ma maritime trading locations that further give strengths to your economy, but then gives a location for your navies to operate from. And we see within this whole idea of the Belt and Road Initiative, there's a clear Arctic component to it. Right now, it is focused on, of course, the Asia side of the Arctic, but the expectations are that the Chinese are going to be trying to expand to the North American side. And to that level, they have been trying to make purchases in Greenland, in Iceland, and in Canada to buy various resource centers that are, of course, coastal. And we think that this is all tied into their decisions to go on the geopolitical context. So where does this take us? And how, how do we think about what these decisions have ultimately led us to? Well, in the case of the United States, it has to appreciate that China has made the decision to be a peer competitor. Another interesting fact, the Chinese Navy now outnumbers the United States Navy in terms of hulls. Now, the United States Navy is still by far more capable and particularly into issues of maritime aviation and in terms of its submarine forces. But we see in terms of the building of the Chinese that they in fact plan on continuing this expansion of their Navy and it will inevitably place them in activity in the Arctic. To what degree that the United States will then have to respond is still something that is not clear. These are decisions that have been made, but you and me are not quite yet aware of where they are going to take the overall issues. The other challenge facing the United States is, of course, that the US, Russia has developed as the Arctic hegemon. In terms of localized military capabilities, because of its strategic forces in the, in the Kola Peninsula, and therefore the following air bases that are there to protect it, Russia has the greatest concentration of forces. So any conflict, any tensions with Russia means that the Americans have to have the capability. So we're locked into this, this dispute that even if the best intentions were still there, even if we could take the Russians at face value, that they only want to cooperate in the Arctic, the reality that is that this is passed because of all these decisions that have been made and therefore lead us into an increasingly difficult and tension focused Arctic region. What this means is that the United States now has to develop and make decisions on developing both its surface capabilities and an improved surveillance capability. It is engaged on the surveillance capability and talks with, of course, Greenland slash Denmark and Canada. It is investing, it is developing. This is what all these strategies that are now going forward are all about. It of course is also putting the monies into an increased capability to respond. You will see statements of attempts to return back to the Arctic exceptional period. Uh, Russia, for example, will be the chair of the Arctic Council for the next two years as everybody gets a turn to do it. And you'll see all sorts of media statements that yeah, let's, let's cooperate. The decisions have been made that mean that those will be paper statements, that we will not see a return to cooperation just because of these series of decisions that I've already pointed out to you. For Russia, they will continue to place their power projection and military capabilities in the Arctic. They have locked themselves in because of geography, but also because of all these decisions that were made in the 2000s. And so that we can expect to see that the Russians will continue to put pressure on the northern allies, and that's Norway, Iceland, Denmark, and Greenland. The issue to be asking is also going into the future, what will be the decision of Finland and Sweden in this new geopolitics? The Finns and the Swedes in particular in the last few months have resumed talking about the fact that they cannot defend themselves against Russia. Now, they don't specifically say Russia all the time, but this is leading many observers to think that Finland and Sweden are about to make a decision somewhere in the near future, not immediate future, probably a year or so, to actually join NATO. Now, given the fact that the Russians have used force to stop any actual former Soviet republics from joining NATO, 
we can probably not expect the Russians to use military force against Finland and Sweden, but we can expect a very strong reaction from the Russians. Once again, these are already forces in play. Uh, there is a suspicion that the, the Finns and Swedes, by the way, did make the decision and have an agreement that if one seeks membership, the other one will join at the same time. In other words, you won't see Finland and Sweden joining separately, they will join together. We'll see as a result of the Russian action, the continued militarization of the Arctic region. Um, and we'll have this paradox. Russia will talk the talk of cooperation while it's developing its military capabilities. Even if Crimea had not occurred, the Russians would still be forced to make the decisions to do this. As far as China is concerned, we'll see a continued continued expansion of the military capabilities. This means continued decisions that will have to be made within NORAD. We'll see them talk the talk about wanting to cooperate, but we will see eventually Chinese submarines showing up in Arctic waters. And that of course will then mean it is a trilateral, tripolar uh, geopolitical environment. So in conclusion, the Arctic, the series of decisions, and quite frankly, we go back to the second end of the second world war, the decisions to develop and ultimately succeed to build nuclear weapons, missile systems that deliver it, to enter into the different uh, tension points and, 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 and tensions that existed between the Soviet Union and the Western allies, means that the Arctic will be the central location now and going into the future. What is further going to, however, complicate how this unfolds going into the future environment is the manner in which the Chinese decisions proceed. The full evidence is that the Chinese will be involving themselves more and more on security issues in the Arctic. They won't be as central as they are for Russia or for the United States, but they will be there. It will be in very much of a spoiler manner. It will complicate for both the Russians and the, and the Americans but it ultimately has the effects of introducing a complexity and tension that had not been there before. So ultimately, there you have it, the decisions going all the way back to the Second World War that now take us to where we are with either a return or a new form of Cold War within the Arctic, and it will not go away no matter how much sweet talk we may have from the various diplomats. Thank you very much. I'm now more than happy to take any questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, Robert, you ah, perfect. Okay, good. You, you've undone the screen. Uh, we are back here uh, now. Uh, uh, we, uh, so, for those of you uh, who uh, 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 who have questions, you can place them in the chat. Enter them in the chat box, and then I will read them. Uh, I'll begin with some of my own then, uh, until we have questions from the audience. So first, I'd like to mention that. Uh, uh, my, my father is Canadian and his father, my grandfather, served in Alaska during the Second World War. Uh, he uh, repaired heaters uh, for a living, among other things, and so he was there to make sure the American soldiers building the Trans-Alaskan Highway to get to the Aleutian Islands and evict the Japanese would not freeze to death. So I have my own personal connection to the knowing how strategic the Arctic is, uh, going back to uh, in my own family. Now, uh, I, uh, I'd like to begin, uh, first of all, uh, as you are Canadian, we are American, uh, we are obviously very close allies necessarily by, you know, an imperative to be allies on this issue going back at least to the early Cold War, uh, to the nuclear, uh, dawn of the nuclear age. Uh, what are some of the differences between Canadian policy in the Arctic and American policy in the Arctic, and how are those resolved? Well, there's three core differences. Um, first of all, the Canadian um, political elites much prefer to look at issues relating to human security. So they tend to define the subject in issues pertaining to the, the, the social and economic disparity that many of our Northern Indigenous peoples face. So a lot of the issues that our leadership likes to talk about in its Arctic policies is in fact directed to how we respond to human security. It's a more of something that Canadian leaders will be brought in fighting and kicking about on the more traditional security issues. They will be there, they will participate, and we will fully participate, but it, not, it is not at the top of the political um, agenda. The second major difference between Canada and the United States is that we have several uh, Arctic disputes between the two countries. 
we have a very fundamental difference in terms of the international legal status of the Northwest Passage. For us, it's an internal water, which means we have complete control over what happens. For the United States, it's an international strait. However, both sides recognize that there are certain key paradoxes. That means we have agreed to disagree and try to keep everyone else out of the dispute. For the United States, they understand that if it becomes an international strait, Russian and Chinese submarines then have the right of transit passage, which means they can go through those waters without asking Canadian permission, and they can do so submerged. That is part of what an international strait is. And so that introduces a huge security threat that is appreciated. From a Canadian perspective, we understand that freedom of navigation, which is driving the American policy, is also a key fundamental for our overall economic prosperity. And so therefore this dispute that has very serious and real ramifications, more or less has been very well managed since we entered into an agreement back at the end of the 1980s. We also have a difference over how we draw the maritime border between North Alaska and Northern Canada. That has also been managed fairly well. What we do have is this agreement to cooperate that most people do not agree. North American aero, Arctic aerospace is a shared aerospace. Canadian aircraft did not, fighter aircraft do not have to ask permission to go into American airspace. American airspace do not have to ask permission. And we have a joint shared agreement that has been very successful. And just to your point about your dad, um, I'd be interested to know if he was going to be part of the force that we actually sent to fight against the, uh, the Japanese in, in, in Kisku. What no Canadian is aware that we were about to go with the Americans when, of course, the United States made the decision to um, liberate Kishku and Atu from the Japanese, uh, that uh, the United States was sending 35,000 troops. We were sending 6,000, which was lo actually larger than what we sent into Dieppe. The only thing is the Japanese had evacuated the island before we got there. But I mean, once again, it underlines the point that we've had this fundamental very close cooperation when it matters. We do have these international legal disputes though. My, yes, uh, for my, my, to answer your question, my uh, grandfather was a technical personnel in terms of uh, repairing uh, uh, heating equipment. So he would not have been a uh, combat uh, personnel had that gone through. Uh, but thank you for that uh, enlightening answer. I have a question now from Marilyn Wills. Marilyn asks you, do you have any idea about how the Biden administration will approach this uh, situation in the Arctic with China and Russia. And I'd like to add, what differences do you see in Biden's approach versus Trump's approach? I think that the rhetoric will be very fundamentally changed. I think that we are not going to be seeing the type of uh, Pom Pompeo statements that we saw that were often deemed to be very belligerent. Uh, in the overall context. And so rhetoric will change. We are gonna see a fundamental change in terms of how the Biden administration approaches the issue of environmental security. So once again, not the major focus of my talk, but still an element that many people are very concerned with in the Arctic region. So we will see policies, for example, uh, we've already seen the Biden administration moving to, uh, to reduce um, certain decisions uh, for North Ameri shared North American oil production, the Keystone uh, pipeline, for example. What we won't see any difference, however, is, of course, the development of these strategic forces and these policies. The whole rethinking of the nuclear policy, the whole rethinking of the ABM goes beyond politics on this. This is part of the, the geopolitical drivers that I'm talking about. And there's very little that it, a Republican versus Democrat or Trump versus a Biden administration will be doing. The other factor that I suspect very strongly that we will be seeing is that we'll see this paradox in terms of US uh, uh, Russian relations. We're going to see the Biden administration trying to sort of quote, not necessarily restart, but to have an open dialogue. But we're also going to be having at the same time uh, unleashing of the security forces in the United States to start getting much more serious about the actual interventions internally that Russia has been doing against the United States. We know that the FBI, CIA and other agencies have not been able to talk as openly on Russian intervention. We saw that with, of course, the statements that came out about just very recently about uh, Russian interference in U.S. affairs. 
So we'll get this paradox that we'll have at the highest level Biden saying, yes, I can talk to Putin. But by the same token, I think we're going to have a much more serious appreciation about how much the Russians are, in fact, trying to undermine, you know, if I dare say, uh, the democratic functioning of your of your society and state, as it's doing in Poland, hung, uh, Hungary and Turkey at this point. So we'll hear the talk. But I don't see as a direct element of what we, what we, the United States needs to be doing vis-a-vis -vis a much more aggressive Russia. I don't see any changes on the strategic policies that have to be adopted. And uh, very, very good. And that, we're on the subject of China and Russia. We talked in terms of the strategic triangle, the Russo-American Chinese one, about Russian and American friction. And we've talked about American and Chinese friction. What potential, uh, what can you describe the relations in the context of the Arctic between the Russians and the Chinese and potential areas of friction there? Yeah, absolutely. Right now, we have this mythology that developed since 2014 that the Russians and the Chinese are allies in the Arctic. I mean, that's the term that's used. Uh, anybody, of course, in international law will say, well, they're not allies because there's, there's no agreement. Um, I mean, they do agree. Russia turned to China as a direct result of the sanction regime that United States, Canada, Norway, and the other northern European states imposed upon Russia forced military invasion of Crimea and the war, the, the, the hybrid war along the eastern border. And that sanction regime still is in existence today. And as a direct result, the Russia has not been able to generate the geoeconomic power that it thought it was going to be able to do through its northern oil and gas. It is oil and gas that has forced Russia to then look to China as a market. And it's interesting. Usually the Russians brag about any agreements that they've entered, the Nord Stream, any other oil and gas with Europe, they say what rates that they, they're given. When it comes to issue of China, that has been kept a secret. And the suggestion is that the, the Russians are barely making any money on the agreements, but it is at least keeping the oil flowing. So it is a, it's an agreement of, of, of tech. submarines show up, even if they pretend they're doing it in cooperation with Russia, Russia knows that it's them that then are the most a threat. The other thing too, of course, is we have the very great differences in terms of economies and populations. One of the long-term fears of the Russians has always been ultimately what happens when the Chinese populations start pushing against the Chinese northern borders into Siberia. And remember, the Chinese are making good on all their claims about re rectifying the unfair treaties that they signed during this, this, uh, the, the century of humiliation. We see them doing it in Hong Kong. This is what their basis of Taiwan is. Nobody is expecting that they will forget they had to sign several so-called unfair treaties with Russia in terms of those lands. And the Russians know that too. And as China returns as a greater power of Russia, remember, Chinese now spend over 300 billion a year on their defense. The Russians only spend 65 billion. So there's a huge disparity that is only going to grow. And the Russians know this. And so those will be the tension points going into the future. But right now, the Russians and Chinese have a common foe in the West, but that won't last in my view. Yes, uh, uh, st uh, steering a bit away from uh, the focus, we've had very good focus on geopolitics. I'd like to ask about the issue of resources in the Arctic. As the Arctic warms, uh, more you know, oil, gas, other sorts of uh, 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 precious, valuable entities there. Uh, what is the uh, uh, what resource claims in this shared region between all these nations? Well, they're probably in the immediate, in the medium term, it's not going to be about resources. Uh, and why I say that is because the technological challenges of the Europeans to develop their own gas are within their, what's called their EEZ, the Economic Exclusive Zones. Those are established. No one disputes each other. The last dispute, well, on the European side, no one disputes since 2005 when the Russians and the Norwegians settled theirs. Notice I say European side because North America, and this is once again, this is something very specific to the, the Democrats, have agreed with the Canadian government not to develop oil and gas in its offshore region. Canada has made that decision under the Trudeau administration. And of course, Obama had had, had that decision. 
Uh, Trump did try to overturn it by opening up a development in Alaska, but that, that never really got anywhere because of court challenges. And it's quite clear that Biden will now reinstitute the Obama policies. On the European side, it is the Norwegians and the, and the, um, the Russians, of course, who depend on the oil and gas. They'll do it in the EZ. There's no disputes. Now, what that means, however, is that you're going to see a greatly increased number of shipping interests into the European side. And it's not surprising to see that the Russian Northern Sea Route is much more busier than the Northwest Passage. And it's because it is this destinational shipping. So we're going to be seeing that avenue. But once again, because of the period of cooperation, the Arctic exceptional period, we actually have policies in place internationally to govern this. So the we will see it. The big outlier is fishing. There is an agreement that was negotiated for the high sea fishing saying that the, the five Arctic coastal states, along with five major fishing states, which includes China and the EU, have agreed not to start commercial fishing until the science is better understood. Now, exactly what that means, we don't know. I'll give full credit, this is an American initiative and it's, it's a clear example of using the precautionary principle. It was the United States that said, we don't know. And once again, in Canada, we often tend to think at, uh, from an environmental perspective, the United States is behind us in terms of treatment of the Arctic. But on this one, it was the Americans that were leading us. We were reluctant to actually enter into that type of negotiations. And so that will cover the immediate time. Of course, all bets are off when in fact actual fishing becomes possible. Now we've seen the fact that, you know, there are all sorts of agreements to limit fishing internationally throughout the, the globe. And we know as soon as there are resources there, those agreements are more in, 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 in fiction than in fact. And so the suspicion is that we will see tensions arise on the fishing issue, but they will be secondary to the geopolitics because there are these international agreements right now that are overseeing any friction points. Yes, uh, uh, on the subject before you mentioned of Alfred Thayer Mahan and uh, Navy issues, uh, he uh, in his book, uh, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, talks about the point of navies being to, as he puts it, sweep the seas of your enemy's merchant fleets during uh, wartime. Uh, and so the idea is you use the navy to encourage trade, which feeds the navy economically in a virtuous circle. Uh, and as happened with first the Dutch and then later on the British and later on the Americans. Uh, uh, as uh, the Northwest Passage becomes more navigable and the Russian side of it also does, uh, how is, uh, do you see uh, disputes over, especially uh, the passage of merchant ships, uh, container ships, uh, so on and so forth? We're trying to have it both ways, if we're honest with ourselves. You know, we say it's internal waters, but that we welcome international shippers as long as they follow our rules. And basically, we've been very open to negotiate to make sure our internal rules are more or less like the international. So Canada was a principal negotiator during the Polar Code. And so we're trying to sort of have the political fiction that we have complete say yes, no over shipping. But we're starting to sort of accept the, the, the inevitability, as long as, of course, it's following international standards that we can agree with. The big issue will be over submarines, uh, because once again, if the United States, for reasons that we saw the Pompeo, uh, administ uh, Pompeo moving towards, ever decides that it wants to actually push the issue, so it has to go to the International Court of Just Justice, and if Canada was to lose and it's to be named an international strait, the most important impact is that it then opens up for submarines. And it is that reason why we suspect that the American successive American administrations don't push the issue, don't take it to the International Court of Justice. That's why many people were confounded when it seemed as if uh, there was going to be what's referred to as a freedom of the navigation operation was planned for the Northwest Passage under Trump. Now, it turns out there was no ship capable. You, your one remaining icebreaker had a, had a very bad engine fire, so that meant that the Polar Star couldn't go in. You haven't built the new icebreakers that are required, and the Healy uh, was, uh, was, uh, was uh, busy elsewhere. So um, uh, it basically, we sort of dodged that bullet. But that will be the issue. The issue also becomes, well, what happens if it goes beyond just being a dispute between Canada and the United States? Germany and Singapore both sided with the United States 
in the most recent series of negotiations setting up the polar code. So what happens if one of these countries decides that it wants to push it? The Chinese did ask permission to send their icebreaker through the Northwest Passage in 2017, but we cannot get a statement from the Chinese in terms of if they accept the Canadian position or not. Their statements are, well, look, we asked permission, that says it all, uh, but recognizing that depending, you know, there's various Chinese interests in the South China Sea that are in fact facilitated if the Canadian position is, with, is, is, is upheld. And there's other positions that would be protected if the American position. So it, it's, it, we don't know what the Chinese actual position on this is. Uh, very good. And finally, uh, I'd like, uh, I'm a historian, you're a political scientist, and we both like to talk about the concepts of structure versus agency. And structurally, you've talked about how the Arctic uh, rivalry and conflict is the rule, cooperation is the exception. Uh, so that's the structure aspect, that there's a certain inevitability to conflict between great powers over this strategic, this vital strategic region. Uh, as for agency in terms of the personal decisions leaders make, such as say NATO expansion into the Baltic, what sort of things could be done that may uh, ease tensions and lessen rivalry? Yeah, what could be done? Um, you know, because I get pushed on this quite often. You know, people will say, well, how do we get ourselves out of this dilemma? I mean, my immediate reaction is we can't. We can have decisions that will provide for paper dressing. We can have decisions to deal with the very important issues relating to environmental security and cultural security. And some people suggest that perhaps by focusing on the environment and on the rights of indigenous peoples in the, in the Northern region, that creates a confidence building environment that then changes the structure. And, and we saw how, in fact, many of the decisions made with the Arctic Council were in fact based on that presumption. So let's make a decision. We'll bring Russian uh, uh, scientists into it. We'll let the Chinese into negotiations about the, uh, about the high sea fisheries. In other words, we will cooperate and we'll cre create a sense of cooperation. The problem in my view with that argumentation is the moment that core strategic interests come into tensions with each other, all that good work just gets pushed to the side. I mean, in other words, there is a hierarchy in terms of what states are willing to do. When the principal threats are not being uh, threatened, then you can allow these sub, sub levels to be addressed. So we can have, say, discussions on how is the North to utilize the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that comes out of the UN. How can we, in fact, apply the impacts of what the Paris Accord are saying in terms of making sure that activities within the Arctic follow environmental standards? All that can be done. But as we saw in 2014, once the West realized the, the, the seriousness of Russia using military force to rewrite boundaries, um, a lot of that cooperation just went out the window. And so I'm very much a skeptic in terms of whether or not, you know, the structure allows the agency to change. Excellent. And on that note, uh, we shall end. I would like to thank Professor Rob Hubert for joining us uh, for this most enlightening and entertaining hour. Uh, uh, join us uh, next uh, Thursday at noon for uh, a talk on uh, the Brexit and the European Union. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing uh, some, if not all of you then. And uh, thank you again to Rob and uh, a very enjoyable hour. And uh, uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.